So, uh, amen. So, communicate unto them. How many would like to see this continue? The Word of God that has been presented and shared with you, how many would like to see it go outward from here and spread? Amen. Now, I'll say this. You know, Dad and Mom were available to minister and travel. They're home church. People don't like to hear that, but they, they do. As is Stan, as am I, and so forth. Uh, you know, as we can make arrangements, one of the things I love is the fact that uh, with the leadership and the people that are in this congregation, in Dad and Mom's congregation and so forth, we have wonderful wisdom and seasoning. And we work together as a team. We work with each other. We love one another. And so we can get the word out through CDs or personal ministry or whatever. We just want the Lord to, to, to lead. Now, with that said, I think that's all the housekeeping I have. I'll get the baskets rolling here in just a minute. Leon, if you could get those baskets to Baron and a couple, a couple others. Um, you can't see the board over there, brother? Okay. Okay. Amen. We are going to open things up today and get in right into it this afternoon because there's some material yet that Stan and Dad have on their hearts, but we're going to open it up with Pastor Nona Grant sharing a word from the Lord of Scripture here today. Mom? I get the first word. <laughs> <laughs> When my husband, at, okay, thanks, Leah. <laughs> my husband at home, when he says something about I'm going to share, everybody in the audience goes, oh, no, you know. <laughs> anyway, I want to share something with you, and, and uh, the Lord spoke to me one time. I was looking for a script. You know how the word just jumps out at you at times? And I thought I should share this with you today. Isaiah chapter 8, uh, and I'm going to read verse 11, 12, and 13 in the first part of 14. He said, and this, this I felt was speaking to me directly, and I want to share it with you today, and take it as the Lord speaking to you. For the Lord spake, to me, spake thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of the people, saying. I see what he says here. He's saying, I'm telling you, you're not supposed to be like all the other people, saying these kind of things. And here's what he says. Say ye not a confederacy, or that means a conspiracy, or some big plot against me. Don't say that. To them this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear, fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And he shall be for you a sanctuary. Now I want to tell you, there's all kinds of theories and conspiracies and confederacies going on in the prophetic world. How many have heard about the contrails? I mean, they're, they're spraying us with poison out of the sky. Yeah. How many How many have heard about uh, the Illuminati? How many have heard about the Masons? How many have heard about that we're Babylon? I mean, all these things that they say. Now, we have gotten word here, word, pure word. I don't think there's been too many testimonies or illustrations shared unless they line up with the word. And the Lord said, we're not supposed to, we're not supposed to be saying, I know people that are afraid to say certain words on the phone because they're scared that the FBI or the CIA might be monitoring their lines. I thought, what a lot of self-importance. I don't care. They can monitor my lines if I say praise the Lord or talk about whatever. I don't care. What have we got to hide? Not one thing. And if they call me to a task for it, God said he'd be my defense. So I want to tell you today, when somebody comes with one of these theories and tries to scare you to go back into a hole, just say, the Lord says, don't say it. Don't say it. Just say, the Lord is my defense. He's going to take care of me. He'll be my sanctification. He'll be my fear. He'll take care of me. And God's going to see us through. You know why? The best is yet to come. God bless you. That's a great book, by the way. On that note, turn to Acts chapter 1. I want to, while you're turning there, I just want to have you look at this here real quick over on the wall. This is a chart that shows the lineage beginning with Adam all the way down to the Queen of England. And it tracks through the, uh, the patriarchs, through Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, whose name became Israel, and it tracks all the way the Israelite line and uh, the king that uh, essentially is still a Judaic king of the tribe of Judah. I had a lady give this thing to me that I had never met at Bethel Chapel in Seattle. 
She came to the church when I was there one day, and she said, the Lord told me to bring this to you because uh, you would be the kind of person that would need this. And I looked at the chart, and I said, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, she gave me the frame and everything, and it shows from Adam through Israel all the way down to the Queen of England, and that's our, you know, it's, it shows the bloodline showing that we're Israel. And uh, so take a look at that sometime. It's a very interesting chart. Um, we're going to get today to the good stuff. Uh, Steve said, oh, by the way, I have one thing to say, one, one special greeting, hello, Lona Margaret. You're looking pretty sharp today. Okay. <laughs> I see Toy fell in love with a younger woman. <laughs> okay. Um, where was I? The Queen of England, that's, yes, that's what it was. <laughs> um, Steve said last night that we can't look to Ezekiel 38, we've got to look through Ezekiel 38. Amen. I want to go the other side of it because in my mind I've gone the other side of the judgment and I realize that God's eternal purposes are not Ezekiel 38. That's right. He's using that as a tool to get us back to something that He wants us to be as a people. And so I want to look at that piece of it because I think it... Uh, provides really a good snapshot of hope for us because we do want to end on faith and not fear, focus on destiny and not despair. We're going to look at Bible prophecy in the book of Acts chapter 1. Did you know that there's Bible prophecy in the book of Acts? In Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, the disciples asked Jesus when they were come together, they asked of Him saying, Lord, wilt Thou at this time restore again the kingdom to who? They asked the question, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, Jesus, as He had stood before Pilate, had made the statement, my kingdom is not of this world. I want you to notice, though, that Jesus didn't say, my kingdom is not in this world. He said, my kingdom is not of. Of being a statement of origin and not location. The same contrast of words, in and of, can be found in another scripture in the Bible. We, as Christians, are in the world, but not of the world. Where are you as a Christian today? What is your location? Are you not in the world? Isn't that your physical location? But are you of the world? No. Okay, so a lot of people say when Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, they obviously, they say, well, then it's out of here. It's in the heavens. Okay, so our goal then as Christians are to get to heaven. Well, then my question is this, why do we need a resurrection? The kingdom's going to be set up on earth. And the disciples asked the question, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom again to Israel? They didn't say, are you going to rend the kingdom from Israel and give it now as a spiritual entity that we're going to go to in the sky? They didn't say that, did they? No, they said, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom again to Israel? Well, my question is this, uh, where did they get that concept? Well, if you back up just a few verses, back up to Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, it says that Jesus, um, in the first few verses, basically was resurrected now, and He had showed Himself to His disciples, and it says in verse 3, to whom also He showed Himself alive after His passion by many infallible truths, uh, proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to what? The kingdom. Where did they get their concept of the kingdom? Jesus Himself had given them the concept that the kingdom would be restored again to Israel. And so they said, are you going to do it at this time? And He did not challenge the substance of their question. He basically said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons regarding that piece of it. I want you to start focusing on being, like we talked about this morning. Be my witnesses. Don't do witnessing, which is not necessarily bad, but focus on being my people, that city set upon a hill, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and finally it'll culminate in the uttermost part of the earth. And so... If they got that from Jesus, I'm curious to know what Jesus said about specifically Israel and the kingdom, especially knowing that we are the house of Israel. See, they were in the house of Judah, and they recognized that the kingdom was going to go to the house of Israel, the first dominion, as it says in the book of Micah, okay? So let's work backwards for just a few minutes, and I want to show you some really neat things about what God has planned for us as the United States of America, as the house of Israel. How does that sound? Let's work back. Let's just run some scriptures. You got your fingers ready? 
Okay, Matthew chapter 19. Let's look at a few scriptures here really quick. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28. Look at what Jesus says to his disciples. He said unto them, after they had finished turning their pages, he said unto them, uh, I say unto you that you which have followed me in the regeneration, how many know what time period the regeneration is? It's the millennial reign. It says the earth is being restored. So he says, you, in the regeneration, this is assuming that they had an understanding that they would now be in a resurrected state, they would have received immortal bodies, and and they're living in a resurrected state. So he says, you, in the regeneration, in the millennial reign, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging who? All twelve tribes. So you can see that into the millennium, Israel is of great importance to God. Okay, this is, this is a kingdom concept that Jesus shares with them. Um, if you want to know who's front and center during the millennium, really, it's Israel. If you look at Jeremiah, we're just going to run these really quick because i got to hurry. Jeremiah chapter 31, listen to what the prophet says about uh, Israel. In verse 35 and 36, he says, Thus saith the Lord, which gives the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon by uh, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divides the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from me, saith the Lord, and what ordinances is he talking about? The sun, the moon, and the stars, because he gave them his ordinances. He says, if those things depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. You know what that tells me? That tells me that when I step outside and I see the sun and I see the moon and I see the stars, I have the sure word of God that Israel is going to be a nation before God. As long as that sun's hanging up there, Israel's going to be in play and in motion as a nation before God, okay? Okay. So go with me back to the New Testament, the book of Luke. Suffice it to say that the sun, the moon, and the stars exist during the millennial reign, and the sea, which was even mentioned, the sea is not even done done away with until the end of the millennial reign, so Israel is going to be a focal point even during the millennial period. Because they were a people that God said, I'm going to vest myself into you, and through you I'm going to administer my laws to the rest of the global community. That's the kingdom responsibility He placed upon them. So Luke 22, verse 29 and 30, let's see some more of what Jesus gives as far as concepts regarding really what He wants with Israel. Because through Ezekiel 38, this is what He's really trying to get out of us, I believe. Luke 22, let's read a couple of verses there. Verse 29, Jesus says, I appoint unto you a kingdom. Woohoo! Okay? I appoint unto you a king's domain, a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on twelve thrones judging who? Jesus is showing which people group He has specifically vested Himself into so that He could administer and rule through them, because that is the obligation of a covenant people. There to be a vessel through which God can administer His laws throughout the entire culture, okay? And who is that people? It's 12 tribes of Israel, isn't it? I'm getting kind of the deer in the headlight look here now. Is this because of the big lunch you ate? I know, I'm going fast. I'm sorry, Jennifer. i got to move along. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 1. Got a couple more scriptures, and then we're going to go to Revelation. 
you see Israel, specifically the disciples there, Israel as well as the disciples were called upon to be delegated authority in His kingdom, which would consist of Israel. And if you want to know, because Jesus said, I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me, the question could be asked, well, what kingdom did the Father appoint to Jesus? Well, it's detailed in Luke chapter 1. And verse 30, let's start with verse 30, let's start with verse 30. <laughs> Kept backing up. The angel said unto Mary, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Who did David reign over? Over Israel. Over Israel. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. In other words, God was saying, I have commissioned Israel to be one nation under God. Wow. One God. And he uses Jacob instead of Israel there because uh, that way he could drive home the picture that the house of Jacob was pre-split. So he, said, he was saying, this is going to be a unified thing. Does this make sense? Because I know, I know I'm blazing new ground uh, for a lot of you, so I really want to just try to communicate this. It says that he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, unified Israel, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Gog is not going to put America under. Amen. It's not going to happen. Now, there's a couple of scriptures that I've encountered, for instance, in the Old Testament. Let's flip back to First Chronicles. Oh, God, I got to go. We can give you an extra two hours. Speak for yourself, Baron. <laughs> Tom is the one that pointed me to the scripture one day because we have like a weekly or bi weekly Bible study on the phone. Good thing we have cell phones with free long distance. So he's reading through the book of 1 Chronicles one day, and he says, hey, hey, I got a scripture for you. He calls me with the scripture, and here's the scripture found in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, very last chapter of the book of Chronicles. I love this scripture. Look at verse 23. It says, then Solomon sat on what? Whose throne? The Lord, through the, the verbiage that He uses here in the Scripture, identifies where His throne is in a people group upon earth. The throne of the Lord is over Israel. That is the place where which He has chosen, not because Israel was good, because they were corrupt. Read about them in the book of Genesis. God simply chose, not by virtue of what they were, but humanity had been degraded into sin, and God said, I'm going to choose a people, and I'm going to upgrade them. It's not that God was looking down the nose at the rest of humanity. He said, I'm going to choose a people, I'm going to upgrade them, and through upgrading them, through bringing them to a place where they will build their entire culture upon me, I'm going to bring a blessing upon them that they can then use to bring the rest of the world up to that level. But you see, the globalist push that's within motion today within the world is to bring America down to its level, and it's fundamentally the wrong direction. An America needs to get back to saying, we will be one nation under one God. If you want to be Muslim, you can live here, that's fine, but guess what? Your kids are going to get Christian education, you're going to get Christian rulings, you're going to get Christian laws, you're going to get Christian judgments, and you're going to lose your kids to Islam, and if you want Islam, go to Iran, because that's the pinnacle of the Islamic faith and expression. As a matter of fact, it's even called the Islamic Republic of Iran. But if you want Christianity, you stay here because we're going to be a Christian nation. And boy, I'll tell you, God would so bless that and it would upgrade humanity. Okay? So you can see that the Lord's throne is designated here as that over Israel. And then in Ezekiel 43, just one more scripture after this before we get to Revelation. Ezekiel 43 Ezekiel 40 through 48, I think, is the last chapter in Ezekiel, is all of the stuff that God does in the house of Israel after the judgment. Now, you remember what he said in Ezekiel 39? He says, I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. 
which leads us to believe what? They had been polluting his name. So he allows for the judgment to come. When you get into Ezekiel chapter 43 now, he's revealing something about the house of Israel. In 43 and verse 7, he, God, said unto me, son of man, the place of my throne. Well, what did we find out about First Chronicles? Where's the place of his throne? It's over Israel. He says, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever and my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile. So God reveals to us some really uh, interesting things about his purpose for the house of Israel. It's the place through which he rules. It's the place wherein he walks. And it is a place that is specifically chosen by God to be a, a living witness of, of the Christian faith in all aspects of culture. That is the obligation that we're under as a national people. And the reason that the Lord said, don't take the name of the Lord in vain was this. It wasn't that he wasn't telling us to swear. I think there's a piece of that that goes with it. But it's the same thing as if I were to take a bride and join her to myself, I would not want that bride to take my name in vain. She's trading in her old name, she's taking on my new name, and it would be a reproach on me for her to live a loose lifestyle and to live like a whore. That's what it means to take the name of the Lord in vain, and that's in essence what Israel has done. We have taken the name of God, God entered into covenant with us and said, I'm going to bless you above all nations of the earth, but you now have an obligation to be my ambassador because you're my bride. And anything less than obligates the Father God to judge His bride. The best of the blessings were reserved for Israel, and guess what? The worst of the judgments were also reserved for her. Luke chapter 1, one more because we want to see what God's ultimate intent is for the house of Israel. It's defined in Luke chapter 1 and verse 74. And how many remember the story of Jesus? Because Luke, Luke 1 is really all about the birth of Jesus. How many remember uh, the cousin of Mary? It was Elizabeth, and how many remember what Elizabeth, Elizabeth's husband's name was? Zacharias, and, and she was pregnant with the forerunner to Jesus Christ, and his name was John the Baptist. Okay, now he wore a leather girdle and ate uh, goshapa <laughs> and honey. So he was, he was uh, pretty, pretty healthy and uh, <laughs> earthy, very earthy. And he was fully anointed by God. Amen. And the Spirit comes upon Zacharias, and he's prophesying about what has taken place with this coming Messiah. Listen to this. This just hit me one day like a truck. Start in verse 68. He says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Who is his people? Israel. Yeah, because the church wasn't even in existence, was it? He says, oh, glory to God, God has, has redeemed now and visited His people, and He's talking about Israel. And He gets all the way down into verse 74 because this is what God is going to do through this coming Messiah. He says that He, or God, would grant unto us, Israel, that God would grant unto Israel that we would be delivered out of the hand of our enemies, that we might serve Him without fear. Now, here in essence is what the prophet Zacharias was saying that God was going to do with Jesus Christ. He was saying, if I could put it another way, it's speaking of a, of a coming time when all of the tribes of Israel would become one sovereign nation under God where they would have freedom to worship God without fear. Yes. And I ask you the question, when did God finally bring that to pass? I'll tell you when He finally ultimately bring it, bring it to pass. Ooh brought it to pass. Teachers, scratch that, okay? I'll tell you how he ultimately brought that scripture to pass. It was with the founding of a nation that was called the United States of America because all of the 12 tribes gathered here, and it was a place where religious freedom was encouraged, and it was allowed, and for the first time in human history since Jesus Christ was born, mankind, the tribes of Israel, could freely worship God without freedom of oppression, and that's what God was building towards. He didn't say, I have come so that you could build a new synagogue and have a new religion. 
Now, it encompassed some of these things as far as adjusting the belief system and the structure and, and understanding who the king was and how the gospel of the kingdom was now going to function and all of these things. But it was interesting as I read this one day that God did, not in, God did not accomplish this through the church as an institution. He accomplished this when the church began to think about nationhood. And today the church is told you don't have to worry about voting, you don't worry about national government, you don't worry about politics, you just worry about how the church service runs, and that's a lie from the devil. Because I'll tell you how important national government is. God uses the nationalized church in ways that He can't use the institutionalized church, and if you don't believe me, just consider the plight of the Chinese Christian. Are they any less saved than you? But do you think that they're free to worship God without fear from the hand of their enemies? Why not? The government. It's not their faith, it's because their government hasn't gotten saved. See, if you have a Christian people, a holy Christian people, by virtue of that, the government is going to be Christian. When God comes along and He says in Ezekiel 39, I'm going to pour out my Spirit upon the house of Israel, I'm not going to let them pollute my holy name anymore, that to me says that God's going to step in, and it's not going to be just a revival where you have good church services, it's going to be a revival that completely shakes every aspect of community, and when that begins to happen, just think about this. If you don't have crime, you don't need judges, you don't need police, you don't need a lot of things that we're paying through the nose for, and you don't have divorce courts, and you don't have all of these different things, and so what happens is as the crime rates drop, as God begins to so totally take hold of everybody within that culture, your need for big government begins to drop, your taxation drops, prosperity begins to come, blessing begins to come, all because of people choose to serve the Lord, and then the government becomes holy, and the whole thing takes on the atmosphere of the kingdom of God, and that's what God's after. That's, yeah, that's what he's always wanted. Okay, half hour. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. As I was pondering this, this, uh, this last week, I, I just, in my mind, you don't have to turn there because we're going to Revelation 3. Yeah, go ahead and get that slide ready, Corey. Don't put it up yet. Um, as I was pondering this this week, I, my mind went back to the book of 1 Samuel. And do you remember when the Israelites, all of the 12 tribes now unified, approached a prophet by the name of Samuel, and they said to Samuel, well, Samuel, we want a king. And do you know why they wanted a king? They said, we want to be like the, other part of the, the, the rest of the world. And God had not called them to be like the rest of the world. God called them to be holy. And do you know what that word holy means? It doesn't mean that you walk around humming. Okay. It means, set, it means set apart for the purposes of God. He says, I want you to be distinct. I want you to be different. But instead, what they said is, we don't want to be different anymore. We're not taking our marching orders from you. We no longer have an appetite for the things that you have an appetite for. We have an appetite for what the rest of the world is doing. And so we don't want to be different. We want to now blend. We want to accommodate and please everybody and be like them. And God never called Israel to do that. So then the first thing he does, he says, okay, I'll give you a king. How about I give you a king by the name of Saul? And Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. And the Israelites said, okay, yeah, there's our king. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. And right away they find themselves in the violation of the word of God because Genesis 49 says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. And they should have put their foot down and said, no, we're not going to accept a king that's outside of the boundaries of what God's word has already dictated to us. But they didn't know the word. And so they were, they, were, they were setting themselves up and placing themselves on a slippery slope because as a people, they were already in defiance to the word of God and their appetites were already consistent with the nations of the world that was around them. And I thought to myself, there's the first globalists. Because that's exactly what's still taking place in our world today, in America today, because the house of Israel no longer wants to be distinct. We want to be like the rest of the world. God bless the world. Even if they're Buddhist, even if they're Muslim, whatever, it's all just equal. Don't offend anybody. We're all just on a level playing field. And they were really, truly the first uh, globalists that we see within the Bible. Um, Revelation 3. I want to just share really quickly in the, in the next 25 minutes 
on something that I saw as it relates to the seven churches of Revelation. There are two schools of thought related to interpreting the meaning of these churches. Um, one school of thought is that the churches are literal, and then the other church of thought is that they're prophetic. Now, when I say that they're literal, the, the school of thought in that sense is that they existed in that day and that they had these characteristics. For instance, here's the characteristics of the church of Ephesus. Um, you've labored, you'd, you've done all of these good things, but I have somewhat against you because you've left your first love. So that was a literal church, and um, we can evaluate that church from the perspective of here's what God likes, here's what God doesn't like, we want to line up with what He likes and not what He doesn't like. So we can take a look at the churches from that perspective, from a principled perspective, but in my mind, that's a surface-level look. Revelation isn't a surfacey book, okay? It's a book of symbols. And uh, we know that it speaks through symbolism and speaks of far-reaching events and times. And I want today to look at it from a different perspective. And I want to look at the churches from the perspective that they were prophetic, speaking of um, uh, different eras of time and the geographical location as the gospel advanced and was carried by the tribes of Israel. Jesus commissioned His disciples to take the gospel of the kingdom to who? To the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Because by Isaiah, they had been already prophesied over that they would be the light bearers to the world. And so, Jesus commissioned His disciples to take the gospel to the uh, lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so, in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, um, they did that. And then Israel would then take the gospel to the uttermost part of the earth, and they would do that over about a 2,000-year period. They would migrate, they would move, they would build cultures on Christ, and uh, sometimes they succeed, sometimes they would fail. But In this snapshot of Revelation 3, and that's where I really want to start here this morning, I want to show you the fact that if, as we look at this from a little bit of a different perspective, if each of those churches represented different time periods through which the gospel was being carried by Israel, then God has something to us, God has something to say to us out of that, okay? And I want you to go with me to Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 1. And Jesus says, unto the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief. Thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled my garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And then in verse 6, of course, he concludes, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto unto the church. If you look at the Sardis uh, church as an era of time, you see that the, uh, the period of time really was roughly, as, as I've read through various uh, prophetic books and, and looked at different scholars that have plotted this out, you see that Sardis really uh, represented the geographical location of Israel's advancement, which was in Europe by that particular time period. Now, if you take a look at Europe today, you see that Europe matches this condition right here. They have a name that they live, but they're dead. Are they of Israelite descent? Mm -hmm. They certainly are. Because as Israel was migrating, of course, they were were leaving people as they went, and ultimately all the tribes made it here. But you see that uh, Israel, as they carried his name, and they were dead to the reality of who they were and blind to their uh, heritage and their identity, um, they came to a place where even today Europe is called the post-Christian era. It's a, it's a post-Christian culture, and they have come to a place where their spiritual condition is that they're dying, they're dead, and it's really the most spiritual, accurate description of Europe today. Europe really is all about dead Protestantism, okay? It's religion without relationship. They had a name consisting of history, but no living power was resident within them as a people group. Now, in verse 3, the latter part of verse 3 that we, uh, the, we read about, we see that Jesus tells them that they're going to be caught by surprise in the last days. They're going to come upon you unaware. Whoa. Five unwise. What, what's happening? Mm-hmm. That's right. 
If you now move on, though, if, if, if we're looking again at these from the perspective that these are periods of time where God is revealing to us something about Israel in specific periods of time, what was taking place as we move now into chapter 7? There's a transition underway, isn't there? Because you're transitioning from the Sardis era into the Philadelphia era. And here's what we read about it. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, not the key of Solomon, or Rehoboam, it was key of David, which was leadership over all of the house. He that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and you have kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou, he's speaking to Philadelphia, hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Now I ask the question, what was happening as you begin to transition from the Sardis era into the Philadelphia, what was happening as Sardis was dead and dying and had a name that they lived, but they truly were coming to a place of death? What was happening? Philadelphia was being birthed, and while Europe was in the throes of spiritual death, there were Israelites with the name of separatists that were coming in droves, starting to come in droves to this place, this new Israel that God was setting to be the mountain of the house of the Lord where He could finish the work with all of the tribes of Israel. And they were boarding boats and they were coming in droves to this nation. The Puritans, you see, they adopted their name because they felt like they could stay in the system and purify it from within. But the separatists believed that you had to step out of the system and, and work outside of it. And so uh, Puritanism gave way to separatism, and separatists begin to found this nation. And given the choice of staying in Europe and planting churches or leaving and coming over here to plant cities and nations, they came over to plant a nation that was built upon the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. As a matter of fact, on uh, November the 11th, 1620, when the pilgrims got off their boat, which was called the Mayflower, they had signed a document. And this document was entitled the Mayflower Compact. And in this Mayflower Compact, it reads this. It says, In the name of God, amen, we whose names are underwritten, having undertaken for the glory of God and for the advancement of the Christian faith, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Therein lies the purpose for why our nation was founded. And it's interesting. I don't think it's coincidental. I don't think it's a coinky dink one of the first cities of our nation that was founded was called Philadelphia. Did you know that it was the first capital of the United States of America? It was our national capital. Did you know that today, and even then, Philadelphia was called the Jewish capital of America? Yes. And what does God say about Philadelphia? Philadelphia. He says, I'm going to bring those who say they're Jews, but they're not. They're still given to rebelling against the Messiah. Synagogue of Satan, spiritual Sodom and Egypt, I'm going to bring them to you, and they're going to know that my hand of favor is upon you, and their house has been left to them desolate. Wow. Listen to ben Benjamin Franklin's statement. Barron alluded to this a few nights ago. Benjamin Franklin walking down the streets of Philadelphia says this, from being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, it seemed that if all the world were growing religious so that one could not walk through the town in an evening without hearing psalms sung in different families of every street. He noticed the atmosphere of the kingdom of God resident in a city that I doubt today you could walk down the streets very safely at all. Let's move forward. Because we see that now time is transitioning to the last, the snapshot of what last day Israel is going to look like. 
You see, they, they went from being a people that, were, that said, we're going to build culture and we're going to build a nation upon Jesus Christ. We're leaving that which is dead and dying, that which has a name, that which has died, and we're going to build a Philadelphia, which is all about brotherly love. It's all about me serving you. It's all about putting Christ first in every piece of our culture. But that's not the end snapshot of what Israel looks like prior to judgment because there's still a period of time in which now they're going to move into a state of decline. And that state of decline, that era, really is detailed then with the instructions that God gives to the church of Laodicea, in which he says this in verse 15, he says, I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot, and I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods, and I have need of nothing, and know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. What fire is he talking about? I believe he's saying to last day Israel's, last day Israel, you left your Sardis and you built the Philadelphia, but you've now moved into a Laodicea and you've grown lukewarm and you're saying that you've mastered ministry and you've built churches and you have all of these fancy ministries and you have told the people how to live the best life now and you know how to confess Cadillacs into your garage and fancy suits onto your back and you say you have perfected this thing, but I find it disgusting. Because it used to be about Philadelphia, which means, by the way, brotherly love. And now it's all about Laodicea, which do you know what that means? The people's rights. What about me? It's all about me. And you can see, the, you can see if, you can, if you can see that these are periods of time, you can see how that as Israel was migrating, as they'd left the Caucasus and, and they were going up through Eastern Europe and made it up through Western Europe and got into the British Isles and now they're moving out of the European area, uh, Europe, European era of administration, you can see, you can see how easily it, it is that, that, that they had left the Sardis and they'd gone through the Philadelphia in which it was something that God loved, and now they were moving off into a situation where they're going into decline, and the Lord says, I'm going to put you through the fire. Well, well yeah, there it is again. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I believe that this is the state of today's church. It's the state of our nation. Now, you might wonder where I'm, where I'm uh, taking this, and I'll, and I'll show you where. Um, if you look at Revelation chapter 21, God has a purpose yet to be, to be fulfilled, and it's found in a city that captures His heart. Here we go in verse 21, verse 1, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. So we could all acknowledge that this is a future event, right? And I, John, saw the holy city. And what's that holy city entitled? New Jerusalem. I saw it coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then if you read... Um, from verse 10 through 12 onward, you see that there is more descriptive given about this new Jerusalem. He says that he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. There's that mountain again, the mountain of the Lord, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of God from heaven. So it's not in heaven, is it? It's an on-earth thing. It comes down from heaven, okay? Having the glory of God, her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. It had a great wall, high, and it had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Verse 14, it says, the wall of the city had uh, twelve foundations now, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Now, I've got just a few minutes here um, before I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dad, and then we're going to open up uh, two questions. But here's what I saw one day as I was reading that passage. So I was reading that passage. I, I, I like to see things visually, and all of a sudden it dawned on me just a very simple truth, and the truth is this. Walls are not foundations. 
Walls are not foundations. It had uh, foundations. It said it consisted of 12 foundations. Just imagine that that's 12 layers, okay? And it was given the name of the 12 apostles. Is, is that a correct statement? Okay, but then he also saw walls, okay? And these walls had gates, didn't they? Because that's your, that's your portal. That's your entry. Okay, and what were these gates named? The 12 tribes. So I'm going to put Twelve tribes are your walls, okay? Now, the principle is this. This is something that God is after that has been conceived in His mind that He has conceived in the heavenlies that He wants humanity to experience on earth, and He's given descriptives as to what it looks like. You see, a foundation is what something is built upon, but your walls are the container. This is, this is your base, but this is your container, and I think he's showing us something here with really what he wants to do with Israel. He's showing us, I want my nation to be built upon the new covenant. Because your foundation speaks of new covenant. It's a symbolic, it's a symbolic snapshot of that. It has to do with the 12 apostles. This has to do with the new covenant period and the new covenant doctrine of Jesus Christ being Lord of the kingdom. But guess what? The walls are not the foundation. Now, what we have done in, in many ways is we have made the walls spiritual when the walls are not spiritual. The foundation is spiritual, but the walls are still physical. Because if you read down through Revelation 21, you see that those that are saved of the nations of the earth bring their glory into her. So she's something that's even distinct from what the saved of the other nations of the, the world are able to, exp, uh, able to experience, perhaps, on their own home turf. This is the crown jewel that God has been working towards, and He identifies it with Israel. Now, now I know I'm really plowing some new ground here, and I, I said yesterday, you're not going to find this written down in any books. I hope you're taking notes. But God has a purpose, I believe, for America, and it's to bring us to a place as the 12 tribes of Israel where the entire consistency of the family is built upon the lordship of Jesus Christ and the gospel of the kingdom. Yes. Because the gospel of the kingdom is the order by which the kingdom should run. Yes. That's what God's chasing. And that encompasses culture, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Now, here's to me what I thought was really interesting. If you look at our eras of time that are up on the screen, what did he say about the church in Philadelphia? Oh, yeah. What was the name that he gave the church in Philadelphia? He said, I'm going to call you something. I'm going to call you New Jerusalem. I'm going to call you New Jerusalem. Now, you're going to come into an era when you're going, to go, you're going to go downward and you're going to decline. But I'm going to give you that label of New Jerusalem for that particular era because I want you to understand something. Your way forward is to take a look back. For the church in the Laodicean era, as we ponder where it is that God is going to take us as we move through judgment and we get on the other side of Ezekiel 38 and God says, you're now going to be a holy nation, I think the question is going to be this, God, what does that look like? Yes. And I think He's going to say, I want you to take a look at the previous era. I want you to take a look at the brotherly love factor, and I want you to recognize that your way forward is to reconnect with all of the old values that you have let slip, restorer of the foundations that have been destroyed. Your way forward is to rebuild that which has been destroyed. Restorer of the old paths. I, I think suffice it to say, um, I could go to Medellin at this point. But when you contrast where we're at in the Laodicean age versus how things were in the Philadelphian age, I would really question how much better we are as a culture. 
So, spin me on this, okay? Just 40 years ago, the number one show on television was the Andy Griffith show where there were still morals and values. And now, it, now within the last decade, it's Friends where everybody's got to sleep with everybody. Someone's got to be homosexual. Someone's got to be bisexual. Everything has to be corrupt, 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 corrupt. And you're telling me that we're better? So spin me on how we're moving forward as a culture. It's just not happening, is it? Today we can blame everybody for our problems because after all, it was the way I was raised or McDonald's did make the coffee too hot. Okay? But it, but it used to be that if Junior pulled the 900-pound television set over on his head, well, that'll learn him. You know, there was, there was a degree where people were taught personal responsibility. Now you blame everybody so that you can stay in your dysfunction and feel good about it. The church doesn't teach people anymore to be overcomers. The church doesn't people teach people to be an overcomer over that unsanctified attitude or that problem or whatever. They teach you how to live with your problem and how, and how to cope. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the victim mentality. You're right, Doug. You know, it used to be that guys would open the door for women and they treated them with manners, etc. And there was a degree of conduct and there, were, there was a degree of excellence that, that I think that if we could go back, just rewind 200 years and land ourselves in the Philadelphian era and look at the culture of Israel at that time, referring to the house of Israel right here, we would have to say that it was excellence, that it was a, a, a degree of pride that was a correct pride. I'm not talking about an arrogant pride, but it was excellence, it was virtue, the family went to church, the family worshiped together, and today families don't even want to take care of their kids, and so they farm them out, and they give them to this ministry, or to that nursery, or to this daycare, and we've, as a society, while we've gained in wealth, we have not gained in virtue. And I think the clarion call of God as we get through Ezekiel 38 is to seek the old paths, because that's where the values are, Okay? We might have technology today, but we need to remember that it's not technology that has made America great. I remember reading about a, uh, uh, a gentleman that came over from Africa, Christian gentleman, and he wrote back to his church in Africa and he said, we need to raise money for these poor, poor people here in America. They, they can't even clothe their daughters. I went to the store, and some of them are half naked, and you see their belly buttons, and they, these, these people need clothes. Shortage of material. Shortage of material. We, we're having, we're having a, a garment malfunction here. I mean, we're just... <laughs> God has got to restore the values. God has got to restore an, an, a val the values of excellence, of Christianity, of dignity. God's going to not just, and, and this is going to be cultural. This is going to be across the board. It's not just going to change how we do church. It's going to change literally everything because the glory of God is going to cover the whole earth and God's going to get Israel back to the place where I believe that she's perfected and that she's a thing of beauty so that the saved of the nations can bring their glory to her and she's that city that's set upon a hill. Twelve tribes built upon a spiritual foundation, that of Jesus Christ. That's where God's going for America. That's why things like our election are so important. That's why understanding who we are is so important as well. And uh, it is my hope that as we've talked about this over the course of the last, three, uh, last few days, you know now, just in a real uh, surface-level look, because we, you know, <laughs> Dad said yesterday, I... Uh, uh, in a very frustrated way. It's like there's so much to say and we don't have any time to say it. And, and that's all we've given to you is just a real surfacey look. It's the lifestyle, really. So when are you doing prophecy dot two? Prophecy dot two. I gotta let my voice recover, Baron. God take us back to the old paths. Amen. Amen. I am at this point uh, it's about 3 o'clock. I know that, Dad, you had some things to say. And then after that, I don't know if, if we're going to have time for Q&A or not, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Do you want this mic? Well, praise the Lord. If you enjoyed that, say amen. amen.
You know, it's been kind of interesting in this, in these series of, of teachings, how that share, Stan has shared certain aspects and, and Steve has shared, uh, shared certain aspects and I have shared certain aspects and, you know, and, and, God, and God just gives each one, uh, we, kind, we kind of zero in on particular things. But, you know, uh, thank God, thank God for the Word of God. Amen. And you know, this, is, this has been some, some very uh, in-depth teaching, to say the least, during these, during these last uh, uh, little while. And just like Steve mentioned a few moments ago about being weary, I agree. Uh, you know, it, it's, you know it's, it's tiresome. You know, you, while, while, you, while you enjoy doing something, let's face it, the body gets tired. How many are here tired today? Come on, be honest. Well, praise the Lord. Some of you are with us anyway. It, uh, and so, but you know, it's been good, and thank God for the Word of God. And I want to just share, uh, not just, and not zero in on just one particular thing, as uh, I'll try not to be real long, but there's some things, I, I wrote down some things early this morning. I slept for a while last night, and then I awakened very early, and I didn't go back to sleep, and I ended up just... Uh, putting the light on and, and beginning to write certain things down that, uh, that began to come to me and was upon my heart. Uh, you know, one thing, one thing we endeavored to zero in on, and that is the house of Israel and who the house of Israel is. And uh, I want you to just, I want to direct your attention, first of all, to Ezekiel chapters 2 and, ver chapters two and 3. If I could do that and... Uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, try to keep you real long this afternoon, but I, I just want to share some things that's on my heart as we kind of begin to wrap some things up here. And, uh, uh, you know, when the, Lord, when the Lord called Ezekiel, Ezekiel's assignment was not an easy assignment. And chapters 2 and 3 uh, reveal this. And the Lord said to Ezekiel, uh, this, and uh, he said here in chapter 2 and verse 3, and he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns uh, be with thee, and thou, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks. And then you, go to this, you get to the second chapter, and he said in verse 1, he says, uh, Eat that thou findest, get, eat this roll, and go speak unto what? The house of Israel. And once again he says here, and he said uh, uh, in verse 4, he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. And once again in verse 7, he said, But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard hearted. I just want to, uh, I don't want to belabor this point, but this is one thing I just want to share this, this afternoon, and that is. If you look at where the house of Israel is residing today, America being the focal point of the house of Israel, but also has to do with Europe, there is a tremendous hardening of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to admit it. People will tell you you can go outside of our borders and they're experiencing revival. 
People are accepting the gospel. You cross the border, come into our country, and the very same people that have gone into other parts of the world are having success. You come back to this area, and you can preach, and you can teach, and you can preach, and you can try to get people to pray and to seek God. And I'll tell you what, America is impudent, and they're hard-hearted. They don't need God. The church doesn't need God. They're satisfied with where they're at. Now listen to what I'm saying. It's the truth. The house of Israel today is impudent, and the house of Israel is hard-hearted at this point. Amen. It's very true. You stop and analyze what I'm saying, church. It's true. There is a hardness. There is a hardness in our nation today. This area, let me say this, and I don't think I need to, I don't think I need to convince your pastor of this, but this area is not a Bible belt in this area. You can try, and people can try to uh, get people out to church. You can work and try to do this and get and do that. And I'll tell you one thing, there's a spirit of pleasure and there's a spirit of apathy in this nation. And I'll tell you one thing, this area certainly is no exception. The house, and, and I'll tell you one thing, so God gives different people assignments. There are people and missionaries, as I say, go overseas and go out of our nation and they're having tremendous success. They're turning out by not only the hundreds, but they're turning out by the thousands. People are getting saved. People are getting the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And yet you come across into our nation, the very same people have a difficult time when it comes to the house of Israel. Europe is hardened. England is hardened. America is hardened. We're impudent and we're hard-hearted. Don't tell me anything. Come on, you might as well say, man, it's, it's the truth. What I'm telling you, it's the truth, church. It, it, easy, uh, Ezekiel had no easy assignment, but that's what God told Ezekiel to do. He said, Ezekiel, this is, this is my assignment for you. And he didn't have an easy assignment. But, and so, and see, look what he said here. In verse 5 of the third chapter, he said, For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, though whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent thee unto them, they would have hearkened unto thee, but the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee. Brother, if that, if that isn't a picture of America today, maybe some of you people have tried to get someone to come out to these meetings. How successful were you? You can, see, you can see what's going on within the house of Israel. I'm telling you the truth. You might as well say amen. It's the truth. <laughs> amen. So anyways, but you know there's a couple of things. And Steve did a great job speaking on, on, the, on, on Ezekiel 38 last night. Uh, but there's a couple of things uh, that I would just like to briefly share. And again, I won't be very long. But, you know, a, a long time ago, and of course, I've, I've been in some of this study for a long while myself. It just, it just intrigues me. But I, I was doing some, I think I was, I'd gotten to the concordance one day, and I began to do some thinking and thought, you know, I just wonder what, if certain words are in the, in the Scripture. In the, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38... There's three places where the word safely is used about the house of Israel dwelling safely. One is in uh, uh, verse 8, one is in verse 11, and one is in verse 14. The word safely is used there. That word safely in the Hebrew is betach, B-E-T-A-C-H. And what it means is, and listen to me, it's a place of refuge, abstract, Safety, it means safely, without care, and secure. Now that's, that's the meaning of the word safely in the Hebrew in Ezekiel 38 in those three verses. I was looking in the concordance, and I, you know, my mind, you begin to think and, uh, about some of this stuff. There in, in, the, in the Greek, 
there is a word, there is a word, I mean, there is a meaning of a word, and it means not anxious, it means without care, it means secure. Now, that's in the, that's in the Greek. The Greek word for that is A M E R I <laughs> Now this is going to be a little bit of a stretch but still just do just 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 think a little bit with me A M E R I M N O Yes. Now, I know that doesn't say America, but I'll tell you one thing. It sure, it sure causes a person to do a little bit of thinking. That word, that word in, the, in the Greek, that's, it, means, it means not anxious, without care. It means secure. Kind of interesting, isn't it? But then there was another thing. Let me just, let me just say this uh, briefly. Uh, Steve pointed this out about uh, Gog being in Reuben's lineage in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 5. He's in the lineage of Reuben. Now, Reuben was title heir to the birthright, correct? But he lost it. And why did he lose it? He defiled his father's couch. In, uh, and again, I, 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 I saw this, and in, in the Hebrew... In the Hebrew, there's, there is a word that means morally wrong. Does this fit Reuben? It means bad person. It means wicked man that did wrong. Does Reuben qualify? I think he does. There's a Hebrew word for that. And I'll get to that in just a moment. There's also, there's also the same, the same word, two different, two different meanings. There's another word that goes to the same situation, I'll, and I'll write it on just the board just a moment. And it means to be wrong by implying to disturb, violate, condemn, make trouble, and vex. What nation has violated treaty after treaty after treaty after treaty. You want the Hebrew word for them? The one that's the morally wrong, here's what it is. R A S H A. Rasha. That's right. That that is that that's right in, that is right in Strong's Concordance. I'll give you the number. It's 7563. Put it down. You can check it out for yourself. That was the morally wrong person, and, and, how, they, and how they show the pronunciation of it is uh, R-A-W-S-H-A-W. Rasha. Is that coincidental, you think? The other one that the other one that means to, to violate to violate. This one is also exactly the same thing, Russia. That's number seventy-five sixty-one in Strong's Concordance. You can check it out for yourself in the Hebrew, and that one is just pronounced just a little bit different. Uh, a little bit different. That one is. Uh, let me look at my notes. That's S H A W. This one is R A W, S H. A H. I'll tell you what. You know, Reuben, Gog is in Reuben's lineage. Reuben committed an immoral act, just like uh, Steve pointed out. He messed himself up. He lost the birthright. And I'll tell you one thing Russia wants the birthright back. And I'll tell you one thing, when communism took over, what did they do? They hated the new birth. And anybody that was living for Jesus Christ, they would torture or else get rid of them. 
But thank God there's been a window of opportunity in which, which there's been a door open somewhat in which the Christian said, but I'll tell you what, they, 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 he lost the birthright, but he also hates the new birth. So these are just some things I wanted just to uh, mention briefly on that. Uh, and then also, you know, concerning the fact of Ezekiel 38 and 39, and I know that all three of us, Steve and Stan and I, all of us, this thing, this thing really kind of, uh, you know, it, it, it's uh, it, it just part of our thinking, let's face it. But So, uh, amen. So, communicate unto them. How many would like to see this continue? The Word of God that has been presented and shared with you, how many would like to see it go outward from here and spread? Amen. Now, I'll say this. You know, Dad and Mom are available to minister and travel. They're home church. People don't like to hear that, but they, they do. As is Stan, as am I, and so forth. Uh, you know, as we can make arrangements, one of the things I love is the fact that uh, with the leadership and the people that are in this congregation, in Dad and Mom's congregation and so forth, we have wonderful wisdom and seasoning. And we work together as a team. We work with each other. We love one another. And so we can get the word out through CDs or personal ministry or whatever. We just want the Lord to, to, to lead. Now, with that said, I think that's all the housekeeping I have. I'll get the baskets rolling here in just a minute. Leon, if you could get those baskets to Berend and a couple, a couple others. Um, you can't see the board over there, brother? Okay. Okay. Amen. We are going to open things up today and get in right into it this afternoon because there's some material yet that Stan and Dad have on their hearts, but we're going to open it up with Pastor Nona Grant sharing a word from the Lord of Scripture here today. Mom? I get the first word. <laughs> <laughs> When my husband, at, okay, thanks, Leah. <laughs> my husband at home, when he says something about I'm going to share, everybody in the audience goes, oh, no, you know. <laughs> anyway, I want to share something with you, and, and uh, the Lord spoke to me one time. I was looking for a script. You know how the word just jumps out at you at times? And I thought I should share this with you today. Isaiah chapter 8, uh, and I'm going to read verse 11, 12, and 13 in the first part of 14. He said, and this, this I felt was speaking to me directly, and I want to share it with you today, and take it as the Lord speaking to you. For the Lord spake, to me, spake thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of the people, saying. Now see what he says here? He's saying, I'm telling you, you're not supposed to be like all the other people, saying these kind of things. And here's what he says. Say ye not a confederacy, or that means a conspiracy, or some big plot against me. Don't say that. <laughs> 